Crucify him! Crucify him! That's what the crowd yelled at Pilate when he was planning to let Jesus go free. Welcome to Through the Bible. Today the Bible bus arrives at Luke chapter 22. It's really a very somber moment in history, and it's pivotal as a moment of our faith. As our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, tells us, Pilate finally had to make a decision, just as every man today has to make a decision relative to Jesus Christ. I'm Steve Schwetz, your host, and before we begin our study of the trial and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, let's take a few minutes to hear from our fellow listeners who also came to a point in their lives when they had to make a decision about Jesus. I'm a professor at a small private university, writes this listener of Through the Bible in the Assamese language of India. The letter continues, I grew up in a village with no Christians, so when I heard your program on the radio, I was intrigued. I had never heard much about the Bible before and found your broadcast unique. The more I listened, the more I was interested in knowing the God you mentioned. Each day I found great joy and peace in my heart as I heard your words. It was overwhelming to discover how much God loves each and every one of us. Because of all this, I have given my life to Jesus so that I may spend eternity with him. Isn't that a wonderful letter? Here's another one. This is from a viewer of one of our satellite TV programs. While searching for a news channel, I saw your program, and it soothes my mind. I belong to a different faith, but our scriptures are kind of similar. I have deep faith in God, but I'm not sure if it's the same God as you. I'm suffering from blood cancer since 2013. Every four to five months, I need to take blood. I will try to watch the program daily in the coming days and hope to learn more. And then here, this one is an email from our Spanish language broadcast uh, in Latin America. I remember my childhood being in our humble home, listening to you chapter by chapter, and my mother making an effort in the midst of all her work and chores to make time to listen to you and study the Bible. Those were her first years in the Lord. She did not know much about doctrine or about any Bible study, but even in the midst of our need, ignorance, and poverty— The Lord used you and awoke in her, and ultimately in me too, a desire to know Him. We gave our lives to Him in that small house, and He gave us the motivation to study the Word so we could be used for His kingdom. May the Lord bless you immensely for your tremendous work and dedication. Well, what a beautiful letter. Our final letter comes from a listener of our Yoruba program in Africa. This listener writes, After a lifetime dedicated to Islam, I have given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your programs have shown me who he is, and I can no longer deny it. I asked my daughter to be a listener to your program because it has shaped my life, and so I want it to shape hers too. Please pray for me because I have not told the rest of my family about my decision. I fear their anger. Well, isn't God good? You know, if you would like to join us in praying for listeners like these, and there's so many of them all around the world, why don't you join our world prayer team at ttb.org? You'll be blessed by doing it. Together, we're asking the Lord to bless our efforts to reach the whole world with this whole word, and God has been so faithful. Let's pray together now. Lord, thank you for pouring your grace and mercy on the world today. Make the light of your word shine in the darkness so that more people will proclaim that Jesus is Lord. As we study, Lord, we commit this time to you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, the last time we were here in the 22nd chapter of the Gospel of Luke, looking at the Garden of Gethsemane. And we saw that there in the Garden that he suffered an agony that is unspeakable. It's difficult for you and me today to interpret that. And then after the experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, why they came out to rest him, and he healed the ear of the soldier, Malchus, that Simon Peter had cut off. And the interesting thing is that this is the last healing that our Lord did Dr. Luke calls our attention to it in a very definite way. That's his last act of ministering as the great physician. It was to restore the ear of the soldier. And I'm of the opinion that he still does the same thing. He remedied the blunder of a zealous friend. And I think many of us today as believers, we blunder along and we don't necessarily cut off ears, but we sure burn ears today are some of the things we say, and he has to come along and heal those. 
we see that our Lord here in a very wonderful way ministers to the very end of his life. Then we find that they took him, rested him, and I read now in verse 63, and the man that helped Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. Now, I think that probably I should go a little more into detail here relative to the arrest of the Lord Jesus and this particular section here. This game that they played with him, they brought him to the home of Annas, and it actually was illegal to hold Christ without a charge. They held him until they formulated one in the meeting of the Sanhedrin. You see, they arrested him before they had a plan. The very interesting thing is that, you see, they did not intend to take him as quickly as they did. Judas came and said, you better get him while you can. Judas thought he might leave the city, and he had no notion of doing that, of course. And so they arrested him, but they didn't have any plan at that time of just how they would proceed. And have you ever noticed the many things that were illegal in the trial of Jesus? They arrested him for breaking the law, the Mosaic law, and they broke the Mosaic law. To begin with, they tried him at night. And that was contrary to the Mosaic law. No man was to be tried at night. The high priest rent his garment, and the high priest was told never to rend his garment. And they rendered a decision the same day he was tried, and they were not to do that. That was the thing they were not to do. It's amazing the things they did. Now, the game they played here with him, they put him in the hands of the soldiers to hold him until the charge was made. And any prisoner that the death sentence was going to be brought against was turned over to the soldiers to play with as they wanted to. And the game they played in that day was called hot hand. They'd take a prisoner, and every man would double up his fist and put it right in front of his face, and then they'd blindfold him. Then everybody would hit him except one. Then they took the blindfolds off, and he was to guess the one that didn't hit him. And the interesting thing is the prisoner never seemed to be able to guess that one because that hand was generally in the back of him. So they had to play it all over again. I think they beat the face of Christ into a pulp. I don't think that you would have ever recognized him. It says that he was bruised more than any man. Friends, he must have been a frightful sight even after they got through with him. It's one of the reasons he couldn't carry his cross. Now, you'll notice verse 66 and 67. This is the first charge now they brought against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. This first charge they made against him, and he doesn't answer them at all. Then we find that he acknowledged, however, he says, If I also ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. But listen to him now, verses 68 and 69, he acknowledged it. He says, Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. They said, Are you the Christ? He said, Yes. Christ was going to sit on the right hand of the power of God. Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's Psalm 110. Now notice verse 70 here. This is the second charge. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And that was an idiom, an idiomatic way of saying, Yes, I am. And they said, What need we of any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Now this is the basis on which they agreed to have him crucified. But this is not the basis on which they went before a Roman court. You see, when they took him to Pilate, they changed the charges. They moved from a Jewish court to a Roman court. Now, will you notice this in chapter 23, verses 1 and 2? And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate 
and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ the king. You see, what they're accusing him of now is treason. And it was so utterly preposterous, Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? Imagine, here's a carpenter in peasant garment before you, and they've arrested him. And Pilate, at first, thought, My, how utterly absurd and preposterous this is. Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Yes, he could say that he was. That's an amazing thing here. And really, Pilate wanted to let him go. Then said Pilate to the chief priest, to the people, I find no fault in this man. You haven't any charge that would stick at all. Now notice what happened. Pilate can't get off that easy. In fact, the Lord Jesus won't let him off that easy. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place, He's leading a revolution. He's rebelling against the constituted authority. You see how they're moving here. And so Pilate wanted to get off the hook here. Then Pilate heard of Galilee. He asked whether the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that, he belonged under Herod's jurisdiction. He sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Now, Herod was in Jerusalem. I don't think it was an accident at this particular time. And now, since he's come from Galilee and Herod's jurisdiction is up in Galilee, he sends him over to Herod. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he'd heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. You see, this man Herod now had tried to see him one time and they came and said, Herod wants to see you. And he says, you go tell that old fox the day I work, the second day, and the third day I'm perfected. Now notice the reaction the Lord Jesus gives here to this man Herod. And then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. Our Lord had no word for this man whatsoever. He's an old fox, and he's gone past the place of no return. He's on the way to a lost eternity. And he's a Herod, and our Lord didn't do anything. He didn't answer him. He didn't make any effort to reach him. This is something that you need to look at very carefully. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And you can see these men down there doing everything they can, jumping up and down. Herod saw that he wasn't going to get anywhere. Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, sent him again to Pilate. He merely mocked him. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Here's the beginning of an ecumenical movement, and it's away from Jesus, because most of these movements are. These two men who'd been against each other now come together. On what basis? They're both opposed to Jesus. And Pilate thought he had gotten rid of him. And Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people, said unto them, Ye have brought this man unto me as one that perverted the people. And behold, I've examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof ye accuse him. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him. And lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Pilate thought, Why, there's nothing here that you can accuse him of. Herod just mocked him, put a robe on him, sent him back, considered the charges not worth considering at all. And Pilate's decision, it's a weak decision. He says here, verse 16, I'll therefore chastise him and release him. And I don't know about you, but I don't like that. That's Pilate's decision. It's weak and vacillating. Actually, Pilate was on trial, not Jesus. Pilate was the one trying to get away, not Jesus. Jesus was not trying to get away from him at all. Pilate's the one that's trying to escape making a decision. Actually, Pilate was on trial. And when this decision was handed down by a Roman court that Jesus was to be crucified, the days of Rome were numbered and Rome was on the way out. Pilate could not escape making a decision. He had to. Every person has to make a decision relative to Jesus. So he says here, I'll just chastise him and release him. 
But wait a minute. That's wrong. If Jesus is guilty, then he should be punished. If he's innocent, he should be freed. But you're not to chastise him and let him go. That's wrong. That's compromise. Marlowe, the Englishman, said that compromise is the most immoral act in the English language. Compromise, the most immoral word. Nothing as immoral as that. Certainly this man was a compromiser. Now he says, for of necessity, he must release one unto them at the feast. And they cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man, release unto us Barabbas. And I want to tell you, this man Pilate didn't want to make a decision. And this man Barabbas, he couldn't believe they had asked for Barabbas, and he wanted to know. And notice what he did, verse 20, Pilate therefore willing to release Jesus, spake again to them. But they cried, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate tried to escape, but he couldn't. And he said unto them the third time, Why, what evil hath he done? I found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him, let him go. Verse 22. And he's wrong in that. Pilate, those trying to escape, making a decision. But he had to make a decision. Our Lord's not trying to escape at all. And they were instant with loud voices, requiring that he might be crucified. And the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. That's verse 23. And now verse 24, And Pilate gave sentence that it should be as they required. Now, why didn't he hand down a decision that was according to Roman justice? And he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison, whom they had desired. But he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And so this man, Pilate, finally had to make a decision, just as every man today has to make a decision relative to Jesus Christ. And he made a decision concerning the Lord Jesus. Now we have here the record of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to Note this, because this is a very important section. Now, they followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. That's verse 27. And Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, to the hills cover us. And he said there's a day coming when it's better not to bring children into the world. You want some viewpoints on the population explosion? Our Lord had something to say about this. He said the day is coming, and it's the time of the great tribulation. He said it'd be better if you didn't have any children at that time. Now he tells them, don't weep for me. After all, he does not want your sympathy. He wants your faith, your trust, because he did this for you. He didn't have to die, and he's not after sympathy. He's after faith. And he didn't die to get your sympathy. If you have tears, you then save them for yourself. He says, you weep for yourselves, daughters of Jerusalem. This is what sin will do to you and what it, of course, is yet to do upon the world. Then we have this story here of the two malefactors that were crucified with him. And we've looked at this very closely before when they were come to the place which is called Calvary. There they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand, the other on the left. Then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, cast lots. And if he hadn't asked for the Father to forgive that crowd for crucifying him, they would have committed the unpardonable sin of putting to death the Son of God, but he asked for their forgiveness. Verse 35, And the people stood beholding, the rulers also with them, derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. The very interesting thing and the anomaly of it all is that if he had come down from the cross, he would not have been the Christ. 
He would not have fulfilled Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And with his stripes we are healed, healed of sin, the awful plague of mankind. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, and Latin, and Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. It was put in the Greek language. That's the language of intelligence. It's the language of education, and of literature, and of science. And they put it in Latin. That's the language of law and order, the language of the military, and the language of government. And they put it in Hebrew, and that's the language of religion. This is the king of the Jews. And he will be the political ruler, the educational ruler, and the spiritual ruler of this universe someday. That this is the king of the Jews, how accurate it was. Now, if you want the full superscription, you have to put the four Gospels together, and you'll get it. That's the way to arrive at a matter like this. Now we are told here, verse 39, that one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. Now, when they started out, both of these thieves, both of them ridiculed him, made fun of the Lord Jesus. But during that three hours or six hours that they were on the cross, the last three hours, I think in particular, this one thief, he saw that something was taking place there, that this one dying on that cross was not dying for himself, but for another. And he knew Barabbas should have been on that cross. It was his cross. And Jesus was dying for him, and he was innocent. And so he recognized that. And he recognized this was a transaction between God and the man on the cross. And the man on the cross was God. And then he turned to him in faith. He said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And that very day, that thief who wasn't fit to live down here, according to Roman government, he went to be with the Lord. May I add just this one word? This thief, by the way, that was saved. He was a thief, remember? He wasn't a good thief. He was a bad thief. And we're going to say just a word about him next time, because I see our time is up. But I want to say a further word, and then we will finish this chapter. We're almost through the Gospel of Luke. Where do we go next? Back to the Old Testament and the book of Numbers. And don't be afraid of Numbers. It's a wonderful book we're coming to. And I hope you have notes and outlines of Luke. If not, write in now. You won't have many more times to ask for them. And be sure and ask for the book of Numbers. Until... Next time, may God richly bless you. Since Dr. McGee recorded this message, many things have changed, including the accessibility of the Internet and other technology. So the notes and outlines that he just mentioned are now available for you in our app, or you can download for free all of them at ttb.org in our digital book called Briefing the Bible. And if you'd rather get Briefing the Bible by mail, we can send you an actual copy of it by calling us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. It is abridged, but we'll send it to you free of charge. Oh, and one little favor, when you call, be sure to mention where you hear through the Bible, whether you listen by radio or app or podcast or you download the MP3s, you overhear a neighbor next door, whatever it is, it really helps us to know this little bit of information because that way we can be wise stewards of the ministry resources as well as reach as many people as possible with God's Word. Now, we're down to our final hours of Jesus' life on earth, and today we ended as he hung on the cross between two thieves. Join us next time as Dr. McGee tells us more about those thieves and how they represent the condition of men and women today. It's a great study, so 
Let's read ahead through Luke 24, verse 7 to prepare our hearts for what the Lord will teach us together. I'm Steve Schwetz. For all of us here at Through the Bible, we're so grateful for your presence on the Bible bus and your partnership in taking God's whole word to his whole world. We're grateful for our committed listening family who faithfully pray and invest in Through the Bible as we together take the whole word to the whole world.